Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the Brown University and Jim to, for this invitation to come to the U.S. and be able to share a little bit of what we are doing in Brazil with the Vladimir Herzog Institute. Uh, my idea here is to really very briefly, very quickly, show uh, a timeline of the history of Brazil, very, very, uh, really fast, and what's going on right now, and then open for a conversation so we can, uh, I can hear from you guys and I can try to answer some questions about um, the situation in Brazil. One thing, uh, just to start, uh, uh, Jim uh, talked about that uh, video that went public yesterday, but right now, many people in Brazil are really paying attention for the elections in the U.S. because we think that is really important for developing of our, our future as well. Uh, if Trump uh, wins again here in the U U.S., it's going to really make Bolsonaro very, very strong. Okay, so there we go. Um, Brazil, over 500 years old, uh, was the country that received more slaves in the Americas, about 4.9 million uh, slaves, it's more than 10 times more than the, the U.S., uh, was the last uh, country to eliminate uh, slavery in 1988 uh, after uh, hundreds of years of social movements uh, fighting for, the, for freedom. Also, Brazil used to have over 5 million Indians, and the population nowadays is around uh, 100,000 organizing different uh, groups. There are groups that has is still today no contact with, uh, how do you say, uh, the civilization, I don't like to use that. Civilization. With the civilization, but who is civilized? Them or us? <laughs> I don't know. But that, nevertheless, they're still isolated in, in the Amazon region. Uh, the last dictatorship, Brazil had several dictatorships, but the last was, uh, was between 64 and 85. And it's important to remember that it began as a social movement. So it, people say that it's a uh, uh, civil, 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 civil military coup because it did have the support of people going on the streets and ask to, for the president to be removed from the office. This is one of the, the facts that people make a relation with what happened to Dilma uh, in 16. Some highlights of the period of the dictatorship. Uh, according to the official reports, more than 400 people uh, connect to political movements uh, disappear or were assassinated. Thousands of people were tortured. Uh, the Congress was closed. Uh, parties were forbidden to exist. We only had two political parties, the one that represented the government and the opposition, MDB at that time. Uh, it was really also very violent in the countryside. Uh, and uh, the main cities, like in Rio and Sao Paulo, people would be afraid when they, they, the phone would ring, when someone would knock on the door, because there was no rights. They eliminated the habeas corpus. Uh, and why I'm putting this? Because we'll see some, some similarities on what's going on today. But nevertheless, after more than 20 years of dictatorship, we are able to regain democracy. We are able to elect a, 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 civ a civilian as, as president, and we were able to get free election for all branches of government, executive, legislative. Um, and we began some policies trying to fix some uh, some some issues uh, of the of the past. So Brazil reserves a l lots of land for the in indigenous people, reserves as we call uh, about 14 percent of the country. And Brazil is one of the largest country in the world. 
it's larger than the continent continental US. So that's a, I like that comparison. If you take Alaska and Hawaii out, Brazil is even larger than the US. Uh, at the end of the Dilma's government, we had more, for the first time in the history of Brazil, more African descendants and brown people in university than we than whites. So it's a big milestone of social achievement, I believe. Uh, this is due to the policies that were implemented uh, since the government of Fernando Henrique Cardoso and was intensified by uh, the Labour Party's government, Lula and and Juma Rousseff. There are some policies as well uh, trying to um, make official what happened during the period of the dictatorship. Uh, it was, uh, was people that suffered during the dictatorship uh, got some compensation. If you, if you, 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 you can believe or find a way to compensate someone who lost a member of the family of someone who suffered violent, torturous women that were raped, uh, children that were separated from their parents, things like that. But nevertheless, there are some, there's this Amster Commission uh, trying to give some compensation. Uh, they, we also started to try to find and identify uh, remainings of people who, who disappeared during the, the dictatorship and the, the remains were found in um, on some uh, illegal cemeteries. Uh, there's a big one in Sao Paulo with over a thousand bodies. It's called uh, Cemetério de Perus. And it's a big project because they are taking the DNA of each uh, individual there and trying to, to, to find out who is the person. Um, however, the democracy in Brazil in that period was, was very fragile, uh, and we believe some of that fragility uh, opened the opportunity for us to be in the situation that we are nowadays. In particular, I put two, two points here. The first one is the Amnesty Act that we had in 1979. Brazil is the only country, as far as I know, that also uh, give a pardon to the agents of the state. So no general, no, no one from the government that arrest legally, that killed, that uh, tortured people went on trial. Uh, in the case of my father, I'm not talk, going to talk a lot about the case of my father. During the q and I can talk a little bit more. <laughs> but just to, to give you one example, um, my, after the death of my father, my mother entered with a legal action against the government, and the Jude, uh, Marcio Moraes, ruled in our favor and ordered the state to investigate the circumstances of the death of my father, and the people that were involved in, in that should be, should be brought to justice. But the government never uh, obeyed that decision. Uh, so. And we're talking about all the governments, including Fernando Henrique Cardoso, Lula, Dilma. They never obeyed to the order of the of the judge uh, that the the people who that tortured and that killed uh, and worked for the government should be brought to justice. And why we say this is one of the biggest mistakes? Because Brazil is also famous for the culture of um, impunity. And Nowadays, for example, um, during the dictatorship, we saw about 450 people uh, that were assassinated. The police in Sao Paulo, in the last data that I have is 2017, the police, the military police that take care of the security of our homes in the state of Sao Paulo killed more than 900 people in one year in Sao Paulo. And we believe that they act like that with such violence because they know that there is a, a state structure behind them that's going to guarantee their impunity, that they can go and act 
uh, very um, violently to the point of killing people and nothing is going to, to happen to them. And that's actually uh, true. And there is also a very famous case of a massacre, the Karanjiru massacre. It's about 22, 23 years ago when the police entered a prison and killed more than 100 people. And that process is going on through the legal system for all that time. And about two years ago, a, a judge di dismissed the case, as simple as that, uh, because he thinks that the police and has the, the right to do what they do. Also, in terms of human rights, uh, Brazil uh, never enforced, never valued the understanding of human rights. When people talk about the right for home, the right for health, the, the right for education, we don't understand in Brazil that has to do with human rights as a universal concept. Mm -hmm. uh, instead of that, there is a strong propaganda saying that human rights is the rights for the outlaws. Uh, this is something that is, is played on TV, on the radios, by influential people. When someone kills someone, or when there is a big violent case, uh, some, uh, some people from, from the media say, now it's time for the human rights people to come and take care of these guys and make their lives easier. So, re so there is a very strong uh, process of the deconstruction of the understanding of the concept of human rights in Brazil. Um, I'm emphasizing that because it has lo lots to do uh, with our work in the Vladimir Herzog Institute that I'm going to talk a little bit later. But nevertheless, I, again, we, 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 we had some big achievements um, after the dictatorship, as, as I said, and now we go to the Bolsonaro government. Uh, First of all, no one believed that Bolsonaro was going to win the election, as no one believed that Trump was going to win the election. We thought that was, that was just a, how to say, a sm smoking curtain or something that would, smoking screen that would fade away. Nevertheless, there was a, at the end we had like two candidates, Bolsonaro and Haddad from PT. And there is a strong uh, adversity against uh, PT. So most of the people who voted for Bolsonaro actually voted against PT. But what we said at the time that were, that election was not an election about people, it was an election about values. We are, it was an election between life and death, between uh, respect and disrespect, between peace and violence, and the government is showing that. I, I, I say a lot that Bolsonaro is one of the most honest politicians that I know, because everything that he said, he's doing. So the absurd that he said, his whole political career, he's actually implementing. So, uh, for example, uh, he praises, one of his heroes is Coronel Ustra. Coronel Ustra was the chief of the secret police during the dictatorship that was responsible for the places that interrogated, tortured, and murdered many people, including uh, my father. And uh, that's one of the uh, of Bolsonaro heroes. Uh, he even said that during the impeachment of, uh, of Dilma Rousseff, he has open racist uh, speeches. He is against the demarcation of the indigenous people. He says the, the indigenous are lazy people and those lands should be explored because there is lots of minerals and other stuff to, to be taken from that land. Um, he, we had a law against the use of gas. He tried to abolish that law. The Congress reacts, actually the Supreme Court reacts, but nevertheless he's being a, uh, his government is, made, is, is making it easier for people to get access uh, to gas. Again, everything that he said his whole life, he's, he's implementing. 
This is uh, all the ministries that work in the in the our White House in the Palacio do Planalto. Uh, all of them are ex-military guys. And this one here, Luis Eduardo Ramos, uh, a general from the army, that secretary is the first time in our history that's being occupied by a military, because that's a, sec a secretary to give balance again towards uh, other, other powers of the government. Uh, but again, all, all of them, uh, ex-army, ex, uh, or even active army, uh, army people. Uh, again, I, 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 I didn't say, but I, uh, Bolsonaro is a former captain of the army. I don't know if everyone knows that, but he, actually he was expelled from the army. <laughs> and, and, uh, okay. Um, we, I have a several slides that are called democracy at risk for several reasons, the military and the government. The government is also eliminating several tools for the participation of the society in, in the democratic <laughs> system. One very important thing that we have implemented, I think in the US you also have, is the councils, like the Council of Education, Council of Health, Council of Human Rights. He's eliminating several of those, those councils, uh, just closing the, them. And some councils that he cannot close because they were created by an act of law by, by, by the Congress, he's basically putting people on people that thinks like he thinks, and or he's cutting funds. So those, those councils are not being able to do the job that they have to do, are not being able to, to meet, they are not being able to, to bring people uh, and discuss uh, uh, the teams the, the that they have. The councils in Brazil, they have more power than the executive branch. For example, if a mayor nominates someone uh, to be uh, a director of a school, the council has the power to remove that person. The council has power to define the budget on, on different areas of the government. Uh, and again, he's deconstruction, deconstruction all that system that was built uh, throughout the years of our young democracy. He is also, um, for example, we have some agencies that were put together to protect, uh, like, Funai to protect indigenous people. He's, he put in the, in the Funai uh, a director that is an evangelist. So he's tried to evangelize the Indians, but Funai is losing his purposes of trying to defend the indigenous people, the indigenous land, all that stuff. Uh, the, the, the Amistry Commission that was really very strong, Paula Brown, was part of that in the past. Nowadays, we have people there that are against human rights, uh, that they say that they're against human rights. Many of them are evangelists as well, uh, far right uh, thinking, uh, people that are against uh, abortion, people that, you know, that all, they have all that set of, of thoughts that you, you guys also know. The attorney generals in Brazil, how they are elected, uh, the government receives a triple <coughs> list with three names appointed. Uh, that list is put together by all the, the offices be, uh, below the attorney general offices. But Bolsonaro chose on someone outside of that list, someone also connected to evangelist movements, someone that um, uh, I mean, this is, looks to be crazy, but for example, Bolsonaro uh, accused the Greenpeace 
for the oil spill that we had in Brazil uh, last year, a major one, that uh, impact more than a thousand kilometers of our coast in the north and northeast. He says that was the Greenpeace who did it. He also accused NGOs, uh, NGOs that protect the the rainforest to put to put fire on the rainforest. And you you know if you say something a thousand times, that things for many people becomes the truth. Bolsonaro said uh, a couple of weeks ago that a fake news against the Labour Party, against PT, is good news. So it doesn't matter if it's fake news against. If it's against PT, it's all right. Um, attacks on the press. This is something very important for me, particularly due to my father. Uh, the most recent, a couple of weeks ago, uh, journalist Patricia Campos Melo, that was a red threaded uh, last year when she exposed all the system of, um, how do you say, of sending mass messages through WhatsApp during the election. She showed that system up and then she was threaded by Bolsonaro and people that are sympathetic to Bolsonaro. Now he's, uh, he said that she offered sexual favors to one witness of, that, of the company that did that mass uh, WhatsApp messaging. So uh, this is very seriously because it's not only against the press, but it's also against the, the, the women. It's against no one ever heard of a journalist male being accused of doing sexual favors. No one dares to, to, to make such a statement. But against women, they do very easily. So it, it's, it's really very, very complicated. And the, we can see during his interviews, he's saying that, uh, the, that journalists should look for another profession, that she should do a serious uh, graduate uh, study that journalism is, is nonsense. It's, um, he, he threatened the Folha de São Paulo, one of our major newspapers, uh, because the government subscribes the main newspapers to be distributed um, through the different offices. And one way to put pressures against the press was to cut the the subscription of Folha de São Paulo, because Folha de São Paulo is really uh, trying to, to show the, the, the truth from the government. But this is it. I mean, it's hundreds of uh, attacks against the press all the time. I mean, this presentation put together three days ago, and it's already outdated. Uh, uh, Jim mentioned about the, the video that it's, it's going on. I have the video here, but it's in Portuguese. I, I don't know if it's useful, but we, we can show later on. Uh, Ministerio da Cultura, under the, the Culture Minister, you have the agency that has the funds for, for move makers. And now uh, the movies, are, uh, they are only releasing money for the movies that uh, has the same, um, uh, ideology as the government. Um, they are also uh, censoring um, ads, for example, from the Banco do Brasil. There was an ad that showed a LGBT guy, uh, I think it was last year, and it had to do with Carnival. And they censored the, the ad because how can you show a LGBT person on TV? This is against the family. This, this, that kind of thing cannot go inside uh, the, our, our families. Um, the, the, the public companies, they have an important role in financing culture in Brazil. We have different mechanisms of financial culture, and all of this is either being censored or it's not, uh, the money is not flowing to, 
to the producers. So it's it's tough. I mean, it's it's been really tough for them. The other thing that really is, is very uh, concerning is the manipulation of data. So in the beginning of last year, when the institute that is responsible to monitor uh, the burnings, the burnings of the jungles, show data that sh that revealed that the increase of the burns. Uh, so Bolsonaro said, no, no, no. He has first he has to show me the data, and then I decide if it it can be shown publicly. And he demissed the the director because he was not showing the data that the government liked. It. This is that has everything to do with the what the dictatorship used to do in the past. Uh, and if we see the sum of these different things, again, has a lot to do with the, the university towards they are cutting uh, funds for university. Uh, researchers are not being able to travel to be part of uh, conference, things like that. This is goes uh, even further of the, the concept of dictatorship. In my vision, we are talking about a fascist regime. Uh, I, did, I said publicly it's a Nazi fascist regime that is being implemented in Brazil. Uh, we have also to remember that Bolsonaro said uh, a few months ago that the Nazist movement of the Second World War under Hitler was a left-wing movement. Uh, so, and well, <clears throat> he also attacked the nation, uh, United Nations uh, when the United Nations uh, reported uh, questions about the the Bolsonaro's go government, and then he attacked uh, Bachelet. Uh, Saying, saying things about her father, who was mother during the dictatorship in Chile. He offended the, the Macron's wife, saying she's ugly. I mean, it's, it's a disaster. And at the end, this is the way we see Trump, uh, Bolsonaro. He's like Trump's puppet. Uh, when he came to the US in his last visit, he salute the American flag like this, like a, a military. Uh, so, um, as we said, the next election here in the U.S. is, is crucial for us because whatever happens here is going to impact Brazil. The, 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 the Bolsonaro government is going to support the Trump's government. Uh, I didn't put here, uh, I just sent some information to, to Jim. But there is a movement led by the U.S. government to change the Human Rights Declaration. Uh, there are several meetings going on right now in the United, Na United Nations, trying to change some concepts of the the, the Human Rights uh, Declarations. Uh, you can have access to the notes of those meetings; they are public. And there is a journalist called uh, Jamil Jamil. What's his last name? Shaj, Jamil Shaj, based in Geneva. He's been following that. So if someone wants to get more information on that, I can make the link uh, so you, you guys can can have a look. I mean, again, this was a very quick summary. And the, uh, the Vladimir Herzog, what, what we decide to do, we decide to resist that. And how did we decide to do it? I have a video that's going to show what you do to try to uh, fight against this situation that's going on. Que tudo o Vladimir Zoy foi criado para celebrar a vida do meu pai na luta pela justiça, pela democracia e pela liberdade de expressão. Ele foi criado para que a gente deixasse de olhar a morte do meu pai e passasse a olhar a vida dele, o trabalho que ele realizou e se inspirasse nesse trabalho em novos projetos que provavelmente ele estaria envolvido se ele estivesse vivo hoje. Na verdade, a grande protagonista do caso Herzog, a história de Vladimir Herzog, é minha mãe, de maneira sempre incansável, 
sempre contando o que foi essa história, ela sempre com uma preocupação muito grande que as novas gerações soubessem o que tinha, que tinha acontecido, até para que não se, não se repetisse. Então, a, a minha mãe, que é a verdadeira heroína da história Vladimir Herzog, meu pai foi uma vítima né, dessa tragédia. O Instituto definiu como as suas três áreas estratégicas é, a liberdade de expressão, é, o direito à memória, à verdade e justiça e a educação e direitos humanos. Por quê? Porque é a partir de uma articulação entre o que foi a vida do Vlado, que levou à sua morte, e sobre o processo de violência no Brasil. A vida do Vlado foi sempre uma luta pela paz, uma luta por uma cultura de paz e uma luta por democracia. Segundo, porque nós temos o um entendimento de que o Brasil é um país violento, que tem uma cultura de violência, porque não elaborou de forma adequada todos os seus processos de violência. O Instituto nasce voltado ao resgate da história do Brasil, especialmente do período da ditadura, que foi um período marcado pela censura e pela violência a jornalistas, que culminaram, inclusive, com o assassinato do Vlado. Mas o fato é que, mesmo 30 anos depois do fim da ditadura, em um Estado teoricamente democrático, o Brasil ainda é marcado pela violência a jornalistas e comunicadores. Então é por isso que, junto com outras entidades, a gente promove há 41 anos o Prêmio Jornalístico Vladimir Herzog de Anistia e Direitos Humanos, que essencialmente reconhece e valoriza a produção de profissionais que contribuem com a defesa da cidadania. É por isso que há mais de 10 anos a gente realiza o Prêmio Jovem Jornalista Fernando Pacheco Jordão, que tenta contribuir com a formação dos estudantes de jornalismo em faculdades de todo o país. E é por isso que mais recentemente a gente passou a articular a formação de uma rede de jornalistas e comunicadores a fim de tratar estratégias de proteção a essas pessoas que, infelizmente, são alvos de ameaças, agressões e violências ano após ano. Um dos aspectos fundamentais dessa transformação é que as narrativas de memória só foram construídas, em grande parte, por um setor da população brasileira, que é uma população branca, normalmente uma elite um poder, que tinha poder econômico, um poder simbólico, para construir as suas narrativas e disseminar suas narrativas sobre é, violências que sofreram. Agora, tem uma memória é, pulsante, tão importante quanto, e mais importante ainda, a gente tem que pensar nas periferias, sobre o que aconteceu nesse país. Então, o Instituto Vladimir Herzog, por exemplo, com o projeto Territórios da Memória, ele tem por intuito valorizar essas memórias periféricas, porque essas memórias periféricas são fundamentais para a gente entender que as violações aos direitos humanos não ocorreram só num período do país na ditadura, mas ocorreram ao longo de toda a nossa história. Essas memórias periféricas trazem uma complementação necessária a uma memória tradicional que a gente tem da ditadura no país. Um dos trabalhos que a gente teve que reconheceu essa continuidade das violências antes da ditadura, durante a ditadura e até o presente, foi o trabalho da Comissão Nacional da Verdade. Monitorar essas recomendações, como combate à tortura, desmilitarização da polícia, é uma das missões da nossa área de memória, verdade e justiça. Para isso, a gente tem que também enfrentar a lei de anistia, que é uma lei que faz com que nenhum torturador, nenhum assassino tenha sido punido durante a ditadura. No entanto, aqui no Instituto, para além da gente afirmar princípios democráticos, a ideia da igualdade, da valorização da diferença, a gente pensa que a universalidade dos direitos humanos ela não pode apagar ou encerrar um sujeito de direito que é encarnado, ou seja, um sujeito esse que é atravessado de marcadores sociais de diferença, que é um sujeito que tem raça, que tem cor, que tem gênero, sexualidade, está inserido num contexto social, num território. E isso é muito importante para a gente, que esta formação em valores seja atravessada destas questões. Porque pensando no Brasil, que é uma sociedade essa profundamente racista, é, de um contexto autoritário atroz, não dá para se falar em formação em direitos humanos do ponto de vista genérico, sem considerar quem são esses sujeitos e como eles estão situados histórico e culturalmente. A ideia do Instituto, então, da Educação era construir algo que pudesse ser ampliado socialmente e ter um impacto muito maior. É, começamos com um projeto que chama Respeitar é Preciso, que atua diretamente nas escolas públicas, né, com um, um trabalho sistemático de formação de professores, de formação de funcionários, de gestores, de familiares e também dos próprios alunos. E o outro projeto é o projeto Usina de Valores, 
que é um projeto que foi criado para trabalhar com territórios periféricos, com favelas, é, que são espaços que sofrem muita violência, violências sistemáticas, onde os seus direitos estão totalmente violados e que tem uma grande potência e que tem um papel político no Brasil hoje fundamental. Os nossos projetos precisam chegar no Brasil e precisam chegar nas escolas, precisam chegar nas periferias, precisam chegar nas ruas. Por isso que o Instituto Vladimir Herzog não pensa as suas ações, a sua atuação em relação ao passado. O Instituto Vladimir Herzog pensa no futuro, pensa no presente. Todo o nosso processo, toda a nossa luta contra a violência da ditadura que nós vivenciamos no passado não se repita hoje. Essa é a grande missão, esse é o grande objetivo, essa é a grande busca do Instituto Vladimir Herzog. Okay. So I finish with this phrase of my father. That's been my guideline since ever. That basically says if we don't care about the others, we are not human beings. Thank you. Before we open for questions and answers, I forgot to mention something important. On um, on Thursday, March 12th, at 6.30, um, the Brown Committee for Democracy in Brazil is organizing a public event in the, in the green to commemorate the second anniversary of the assassination of Maria de Franco, the city councilwoman um, from Rio de Janeiro who was killed and who, we know who actually killed her, her now or, and, and the driver with her, Anderson Gomes, but we don't know who ordered the death. And so we're carrying out a campaign nationally to ask the question, who ordered the murder of Maria de Franco and then all the other human rights activists, social movement activists who have been killed in the last year and a half. Um, we'll be distributing posters next week and stickers and we're hoping people can come to that public event which will be a candlelight vigil, uh, people speaking to uh, you know, inform the Brown community about the situation in Brazil. And that'll be on Thursday of the 12th and we'll be letting people know about that. So we're, we have now time for questions and answers and the floor is open. and. Anyone who wants, you can field the questions or we'll call on people, and whoever would like to ask a question should feel free to do that. You were shy. <laughs> I thought that was a Brazilian characteristic. Moisés, your question. <laughs> yes? So, so are there any watchdog organizations that have any sort of power behind them in Brazil with regards to like protecting freedom of the press that that kind of thing like what's that landscape like what do you mean but, uh, like are they organizations either within the Brazilian government or uh, NGOs run in the country that are looking out for uh, yeah. protections of journalists yeah yeah there are several mm -hmm. There are some Brazilians like FENAGE, which is the <coughs> National Federation of Investi Investigative Journalists. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually monitor and they have all the data on violence against journalists. Uh, and then you have uh, you have even the, how do you translate the, the organization, the Brazilian Law Association. The Brazilian Law Association involved in that, uh, the, the Vlado Protection Network that we lead, <coughs> all these organizations are part of, and some are not uh, Brazilian organizations like Article 19, Human Rights Watch, uh, they are part of that network that is monitoring, and it's because we monitor, we try to give light to those violence. Brazil is the fourth country that kills more journalists worldwide nowadays. Uh, the first two are countries in state of war, the third is Mexico with, because of the drug cartels, and then we have Brazil. Uh, so again, we, we try to give light because people don't know about those violences. Uh, and we try to give uh, legal support for journalists that are being threatened somehow. Uh, there are journalists that had to leave Brazil. One of the journalists that's being threatened as we speak is uh, Glenn. 
Frank Linwald is being threatened because uh, of the of the leaks that uh, uh, of of text messages of people from the government. So he's leaking those messages out that shows corruption and all that stuff inside the government, and it has to do with also with the process against uh, President Lula. The, the thing about the, I normally I don't like to to say if I think he's guilty or if he's not guilty, but what is not right is the way of, of the, how the legal process was handled against Lula. We everyone that could see with some objectivity could notice that that project had an agenda, a political agenda, due to the elections of uh, 2018. So the, the process was ran in a way to guarantee that Lula couldn't be one of the candidates for presidency. And and it is really, really shameful. Two weeks ago Lula was again uh Moro ordered Lula to uh, go to the police and give a statement because he offended Oh, he, he did offend, I don't even remember, he, because he offended someone. But we see the sons of Bolsonaro, the Bolsonaro family, offending the, the Supreme Court, court, and nothing happens. Moro used uh, a law called the National Security Law, which is a law from the dictatorship period. He invoked that law to call Lula for the position a couple of weeks ago. Um, so again, uh, I, I also think that it's even worse than a dictatorship because it's a dictatorship with the legitimacy of the vote. So it's really, really complicated. Moises. I don't have uh, any questions, just a uh, comment. Uh, congratulate your presentation. Uh, in what really comes my attention is the so to speak, the emphasis that you give to uh, take into consideration the legacies of the slavery to understand the violence in Brazil. Uh, this is also something that uh, until very recently I avoided, but there's no way to, to come up with something sustainable if we do not consider almost 400 of slavery and all the violence that it represents uh, against everyone, not only African uh, descent, but also indigenous. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is uh, something that I consider tremendously important in the work of your institute. So, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And this is a website. That website receives more than 2,000 access every day and that we put together. And it, it, it's the most comprehensive uh, portal about that period, and you see, uh, talk about the black belt. It has different views of the, the things about that period. But for example, we have some research about uh, the question of race, the question of the indigenous, you see, LGBT during the dictatorship. Uh, those access that you have every day is about people that are researching about that period. Uh, it's uh, a, a research that we've been conducting for over five years now. This is, they say that this is the only recommendation of the National Truth Commission that was implemented. Uh, oh, thank you. Yes. Speech. Speak louder. Okay. <laughs> you said your speech that uh, your institute is teaching about human rights in marginalized neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. I think it's around Sao Paulo, Brazil, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. And I want to know uh, how uh, those people from the marginalized neighborhoods, parts of Brazil, reacts or accepts about uh, human rights. Because we know, we Brazilian know that this idea of human rights and not it's not that accepted yeah, culturally definitely. we always against it yeah, so. that's a very good question 
Well, that program is impacting over one million children uh, from kindergarten to the end of elementary school. We chose that the, those ages because is in this period of the of the person that when he's putting together his values uh, that will define his as an adult as a as an actor of a, a democratic society. So we try to influence from the beginning. Uh, when we are thinking, first of all, wh where does the, the idea came from? Uh, in 2014, I think we were talking about that last night, uh, when we, the National Truth Commission was about to start its works in Brazil, the, the, the institute promoted a, a conference, and we brought Tilto Milgram from the Yad Vassan, and Américo in Calcaterra uh, from the United Nations to talk about truth and memory, uh, because we were going to have something big going on in the country. Uh, and and American Calcaterra said one thing that was really impacted me, that really impacted me. He said that the countries that had as a policy the study of human rights as part of the curriculum of their schools were able to reduce urban violence in a sustainable way. So the only way for you to reduce urban violence mm -hmm. that lasts is for you to change the mindset, the perception about diversity, the, the, the understand of respect, all of that. So when the Institute moved towards education, we said, well, that's the area we, we have to do something. People measure the quality of education on the score of mathematics, of uh, reading and writing, and sometimes science. But there's something that I believe is even more important, is the understanding of the individual about the society to where he lives in. Because that element is what defines the person as a citizen. The others, mathematics, uh, literature, are tools for you to play your role in the society, but do not define who you are. And education is something that, that goes beyond learning tools. Um, so we, we decide to go on, on that direction. But the problem is that human rights, the concept of human rights, is so destroyed that we did not use the name human rights in our program because of rejection. We, we chose to use a different name, something that we believe that everyone likes, which is respect. So the, the name of the program is Respect is Needed. We believe that everyone is, is, has, has sympathy uh, about, everyone wants to be respect. Many people don't want to respect, but respect everyone wants to receive. So, uh, and the respect is, is the foundation of human rights, if you see the, the, the respect for, uh, for our rights. Um, in the beginning, uh, we began the program doing a qualitative research in four different regions of Sao Paulo. We interviewed the students, the families, teachers, uh, workers of the workers of the schools, uh, the people from that manage the schools. And from that, we came with a diagnosis because there are dozens of human rights issues in the school environment. And you cannot embrace all of them at the same time. So we chose the, the main one, the, the, the ones that we, we, uh, that we thought were more important. Let me see if I can get here. All the material is online from the, from the programs. Uh, let's see if it works here. Um, and, and we began a pilot tryout with 20 schools, five of each region of Sao Paulo, uh, about 15,000 students, 20 schools, 15,000 students. In Sao Paulo, things are big, always. Um, that was sponsored by the Human Rights uh, City Secretary in a partnership with the education uh, secretary. 
Then on the second year, we expanded the whole uh, system of public schools, city public schools of Sao Paulo, which is 1,500 and 1,560 schools, over 1 million children. We also hire a institute to do monitoring and reporting of the program. So we establish a, a Marco Zero, how do you translate that? A, a baseline, we, we establish a baseline. We have, uh, um, how do you say, key index, KPIs. We put together KPIs and we follow the program through the years, measuring against those KPIs from that baseline to be able to report uh, the impact. So we do have a report with qualitative and quantitative data of what changes in the, in the public schools with our program. It's in the, in, it is in the, its fifth year now. Uh, and now the, the community of the faculties, they do embrace the program. And what's, what's I think is even more in, uh, interesting is that that program has gone through four different education secretaries. It begins with the government of uh, Haddad from PT, and then it went through the Doria government, uh, PSDB. Now it's in the Bruno Covas government. And every time the government wants to invest more and more in this program because of the structure of the program, because of the response from the community. Uh, so they are putting, we spend in this program per student, per year. Let me see how much. This, a quarter of dollar. This is the cost of the program per year, per student. Maybe it's less because of the evaluation of the health the last weeks but it's about a quarter of a dollar per student per year. Thank you. And, and it's in Sao Paulo, but now we are expanding that to a city called Goiânia in Pernambuco uh, with the support of a private company, uh, Clabin. So Clabin has an operation in that uh, city uh, it's a small, very poor city, and they are they are putting money for us to take Respeitada Preciso to Goiânia. This is one of the educational programs. The second one that showed happily there, but uh, it doesn't says that, but I want to, to emphasize uh, Values Mil, Usina de Valores. It's a uh, it's a program where we try we we try to make a dispute of values with conservatives and groups of our society. So that program is in its third year. It receives money from emendas parlamentares from... From parliamentary allocations, special uh, parliamentary allocations. Special parliament allocations. It's going on in Sao Paulo, in the, in the periphery, in the boundaries of the city. Uh, the Complexo do Alemão, Rio, in Pernambuco, Recife, and Salvador. And we are trying, and we chose to make a dispute of value with the Evangelic Church. So we use people from that group that are more progressive, and we work with them uh, to try to make, because the church by definition, and one of the products of that program I, I, I brought for you guys, I mean, we do several, rallies, conference, things like that. And this is one book that was even used for the samba that won the title in Rio. They used this book, Jesus e os Direitos Humanos, Jesus and the Human Rights. So religion is about human rights. Uh, and sometimes the church and, or people from the church, they try to distort the, the concept of religion, the, the concept of faith and make a very conservative speech from that, uh, a speech of fear, a speech of submission, uh, which is not the essence of religion. So we, 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 have, we have groups in the, in the evangelic church that are progressive, like Pastor uh, Henrique, uh, he's a very influential guy, 
and, and they help us. It, for, for example, there are some evangelical churches that do uh, same gender marriages. Uh, it's crazy to imagine that, uh, but they do that. Uh, they support LGBT. You have LGBT uh, priests in the evangelic church, but they are the minority. We try to help that minority with um, communicators of their own community to give voice to them and make this dispute of space. It's a very interesting uh, program. It, it, it is also supported by Oak Foundation, uh, an open society. We receive funds from them for that program as well. Any other questions? Um, before we give any more questions, there's three people I did. I don't want to forget. I apologize. Uh, Tanata wanted to make a brief announcement about the film series tomorrow. Do you want to just? You're gonna have uh, five short films tomorrow. You're gonna be doing a uh, spring film series about. Um, there are all movies that touch the issue of the blackness. So tomorrow you're gonna be screening uh, five short movies by Afro Brazilian directors at, at seven. Seven o'clock here. here in the Joukowsky Auditorium. So you're all welcome to come to that. So I think we have three uh, people. I didn't see that. One, two, three. So. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, you are thank you for the uh, for your presentation. I want uh, this question for you. Is uh, like a, there a relationship between the amnesty law and the power that the, the military kept during over the years in Brazil and uh, the emergence of the Bolsonaro government? Mm -hmm. Maybe in a different way than in Argentina that. The process, the process was different with judgments and the military are weak. Uh, and we had uh, a government for four years with Macri. He uh, was, a, was a right government, but the, the agenda and the arguments, uh, uh, like the, the human rights agenda, he couldn't touch that. Well, one of the things that's really different between Brazil and Argentina is that in Argentina the militaries went to jail. So they were brought to justice. In Brazil they were not <coughs> brought to justice. Uh, there is an interview from my mother about, uh, I don't know, seven, eight years ago, that she said that she's fed up of paying the salary of the people that killed her husband. because we pay the salary of these people for taxes. Um, one of the issues that we have also in Brazil that I think is quite different from Argentina, I don't know nowadays because I know that Argentina is not in good shape, but the quality of education. I have a perception, maybe wrong, that people in Argentina are more educated and they know more about its history. There are many people in Brazil that don't believe that there was a dictatorship. The president says that there was no dictatorship in Brazil. Uh, so, uh, so everything gets a little bit more complicated because when a guy comes and says that he has to exterminate, ext to kill all the radis, all the, the left wing, the leftist people, because they, try, they are trying to transform Brazil in a Venezuela or in a Cuba. For, for, it's incredible, but that speech makes sense for a good portion of our population, 10, 15 percent of the population. I hear that all the time. Uh, so, um, one thing that has also this, this, public education. Most of people in Brazil, they rely on public education. Back during the dictatorship and before that, most of the people used to live in the countryside, for you guys who studied history, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. So the public school was very good, but it was for a few people. My mother studied in a public school. My father, people that are more than 60 years old in Brazil, most of them went to public school. And those were very good, but they were for few people. In the 70s, people come from the countryside to the urban centers. And in the democracy, and after the dictatorship, the policy was to give education to everyone. So 
nowadays there are public schools to everyone, but there is no quality in that education. Uh, so that's a dilemma that we have in Brazil. Uh, you give it a dilemma. I mean, education has to go to everyone, but how do you how do you balance the, the quality? What what's what's the goal of education? Uh, a person that I, I like very much that's now a uh, visiting professor at Columbia, uh, Alexandre uh, Schneider, Alexandre Schneider, was the secretary of education in Sao Paulo. He's a very good guy, and he, he tried to do a lot. But I asked him a very simple question, and I think we have to ask ourselves that same question. Why, what's the question zero in education? Educate for what? What's the goal of education? Have you ever thought about that? What what should be the the goal that at the end you say okay we we reached that goal so the, the education process was good is to learn to read and write mathematics a little bit of history of your country what is the goal of education because if we don't know that goal how can you put together a policy how can you put together a process the goal in Brazil and I heard that from several educators. The goal in Brazil is to give education to everyone. Everyone to be able to attend a school. The, schools, the school should be able to host everyone. But you don't hear the, 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 the philosophical concepts of educating, right? Uh, I think education, the goal of education is to be able to enable each one of us to be a um, how to say, a, a citizen in a democratic society, uh, understanding that society and, and being able to make its own judgment mm -hmm. and develop its own opinion about the facts. I mean, you, you have to be able to understand the society that you live. You have to be able to somehow understand the why the present is the present? What came to bring you to, to, to the status quo that we have today? What brought us here? So what should we do for a better future? People don't have that. And that explains a little bit, also here in the US, how can you, in one election, I like Barack Obama, and the following one, I like Trump. How can you have that such a, uh, such a big swing? Because education is not good here in the US <coughs> as well. Education, when people talk about education, most of the time I see that famous scene of modern times of Charlie Chaplin, the guy in the production line, you know. We have one, two, there is more questions. Let's, let's say Joyce's and Antonio's questions together. If you can both ask them, then that will be the last <coughs> answer for both of you both. So we can finish. And this material is for you guys. I have uh, business cards for you to be able to contact me. Uh, this brochure is in Portuguese and in English that talks about what we do, and we have the book of Jesus and, and Direitos Humanos for all, everyone. Evangelical churches. So I was curious to know if you have any support from the Jewish community at all, and if and and what is the um, position of the Jewish community uh, towards the current government? If you can say anything about that. <laughs> Antonio, could you tell us about the ruling of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights on oh. the Radio Law case? Mm -hmm. How the Brazilian state has reacted to okay. this ruling? I'm going to begin with this because it's easier and more this <laughs> more fun. So again, about two years ago, uh, the the court ruled that Brazil had committed crimes against humanity in in the case of my father and all people that were submitted to torture. So it's a very important sentence because it goes beyond my father. And specifically in the case of my father, it said that the case should be open again, investigate, people brought to justice. It gave a financial reparation of about $20,000 to the family. But the most important thing, and I ask that to be put in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the rule for that, is that the government, with the presence of the, the army, the navy, and the, whatever, the, all the forces, should do a public act 
and ask for forgiveness about what happened in that period. None of these three things uh, took place yet, so we are br bringing it back to the to the court, and they, I mean, but you know how those things work. It may take forever. About the Jewish church, that's quite interesting. My father was Jew, however, he didn't practice. My grandmother did practice. He had, she had her chair in the synagogue. She used to go to all the rituals. And when my father died, no one from the Jewish um, community gave support to her. So this is the first thing that I remember. Huh? Henry Sobel did. No? Okay. Henry Sobel, we, I, I like to give, uh, to leave the, the public understanding of Henry Sobel, Henry Sobel that he mentioned. And his story is important because when my father was killed, as uh, Jim said, the government said that he had committed suicide. And according, which is also, I don't know if it's true or not, there is some debate on that. According to the Jewish tradition, uh, the, the most, the, the, the ugliest thing that a Jew can do is to take out his own life. That's the biggest sin that a Jew can do. And it's the biggest shame. So if a Jew do that, they have to be buried on the boundaries of the cemetery. When the the, the people that prepared the board the body for for burial saw how my father was, they call they call the rabbi. The rabbi of São Paulo was outside Brazil, and Sobel, who was an American and had just arrived to Brazil was the guy in charge. And when, when he heard the description, he said, this guy did not take his own life. He was assassinated. So he has to be buried in the middle of the cemetery. So it's the first uh, statement from an institution against the fake news that the government was trying to put together. I mean, fake news is something much older than people think. Uh, so that's, that's, that's very important. The thing about the Soba is that when there was the inquire, uh, and then uh, and again he was part of the ecumenic act in the cathedral, which is something really big as well, because a rabbi is not supposed to go to a temple where there are people buried. That's against the Jewish tradition, and the uh, uh, cathedral has people buried, and there, there, you have the bishops buried there. So, I mean, there are some very important uh, elements w about what happened in the, in the beginning. But then, when the inquiry began, the military inquiry about the death of my father, Sobel didn't want to go uh, uh, and give his statement. Uh, that's all I have to say about, about him. People think that I am Jew. And nowadays, we have several very interesting Jewish group in our society, progressive ones. And they have been doing a very, very good uh, job of resistance against this government. So I, I, I see a new generation of these Jewish people uh, that are really doing a great job. Just a couple of weeks ago, there was a, an event that uh, there is this Jewish group, I don't remember the name, and Judeos, Jewish for Democracy. They gave a title to Lula, and the guy who handled the title was my son. So, uh, so again, uh, there is this thing that really bothers me is because they didn't give support to my grandmother. Uh, but since the, f the, the creation of the institute, people from the Jewish community in Sao Paulo, they come to me and they say, Ivo, can you help, can the institute help to integrate the Jewish community with everyone else? I say, oh, yes, of course. First of all, stop doing things for your community. Do things for everyone. That would help a little bit. Uh, but uh, for the, the journalism award for the students, was financed uh, through during three years through in the beginning the first three years by the Arimax Foundation. Do you know Arimax Foundation is a foundation of the family uh, that owns the Susano paper uh, 
Pfeffer, the Pfeffer family, one of the richest families in Brazil, and they are very orthodox uh, Jews, and they gave money to the to the award for for students. They they gave they they gave money for us. We put together. We we use different forms to do our job, like putting together books, uh, seminars, um, TV series. We use music a lot. And a few years ago, we put together a a spectacle of classical music called uh, Anne Frank Diary, which is a piece composed by an Italian composer with Otto Frank, with the father of Anne Frank. Mm -hmm. It's a two hour long piece, and the first time that it was played, the whole thing was in Brazil that we put it together, uh, and the Arimax, uh, the, the Pfeffer family gave some money to help us to put that together. Uh, I should have brought, I have the DVD. It's, it's gorgeous. It's classical music with electronics. It has a, a 120 choral that also acts. Then you have a philharmonic, you have dance, and this Any Frank Diary. And a friend of mine at the end said, oh, I didn't like it. Say, why? why you didn't like it? Oh, it's too sad. It's Any Frank. Thank you very much. Thank you.